thank you, and thank you all for coming. So, in 2014, I gave a talk at EMF, and it had a much snappier title. <laughs> Why are computers so shit, and what can we do about it, if anything? Uh, and maybe I should have just reused that title this year, um, because it's kind of the same theme here, although there will be a smidgen of new optimism this time that we didn't have before. Just a smidgen. So, computers. It's 2024. They're still terrible. They're terrible in many, many, many ways. But in particular, riddled with security vulnerabilities. And uh, fine people in Microsoft and Google counted a couple of years ago the underlying causes of those vulnerabilities. And it was interestingly about the same. About 70% of them were memory safety errors. And I'm going to explain uh, what that means exactly in a few minutes. So that's kind of bad. But the following data is very, very, very bad. And it should send a horrifying shiver of fear down your spines. Uh, these are estimates, recent estimates, of the number of lines of even just open source code out there in the world. And we get about 6 billion lines of C and 2 billion lines of C++. So if you want to make anything better, you have to do something about that. And that's very hard, right? So you should feel, really you should feel very, very sad. Right? People make up cute little logos for these vulnerabilities. And that kind of makes you think they're exciting. And people give talks at EMF camp or CTC or DEF CON or whatever about cool new vulnerabilities. And that is indeed cool and exciting. But 8 billion lines of code out there. Dear, what could we possibly do? So this talk, as I say, there's supposed to be a smidgen of optimism. There is a thing that, in principle, we could do. And I'm going to explain a tiny bit about it. But, let me see. I'm going to try, so I promised that I would try and make this maximally accessible. So let's just start with a tiny bit of audience participation. How many of you have never read or written any lines of C or C++? You live in a happy, happy world. <laughs> and I'm sorry about what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. um, for the others, I mean, I'm already sorry, but so are you, so that's OK. Uh, so how do computers work? It's where we have to start. Computers work with data, and the data is stored in some kind of memory in the beginning of time, maybe in tanks of audio signals, in tanks of mercury, or other kind of wacky things. It doesn't matter how it's implemented in physics, but it's stored in memory. And it's, so in each piece of memory, in each location of memory, you store some number. And the key thing is that these locations are addressed also with numbers. So you might have, you know, location 13 storing number 10, and location 15 storing number 12, and location 12 storing number 23, and so on. And it's all just numbers. Right? It might be that that 12 here is actually a reference to location number 12, or it might just be the degree centigrade that it is in EMF camp today. Right? You can't tell, right? They're just numbers. OK, so that's a very powerful idea, dating back to like the very late 1940s, as far as I can tell. And every computer is like this. Um, and that's exposed, that idea, in the language that people use to write programs. Right? So here is a piece of C code. Um, and I'm going to explain it. Right? The idea is that it starts out with two bits of data, one called X and one called secret key. That might be your PIN number, let's say. And the idea is that these, this piece of code is never supposed to touch the secret key. And you can see the name secret key doesn't appear in that code anyway. So you might reasonably expect that that code will never touch the secret key and that it will be safe, whatever happens. 
You might expect that. Okay, what happens when you step through this code, through this list of instructions line by line? So first, for these first two lines here, well, the second and the third line, it creates two little chunks of memory. Of, and this one is at address 14, and this one is at address 18, and that one stores one, and that one stores your bin. Fine so far. And then we start executing these lines of code, step by step. And here, this says, tell me the address of location X. Well, the address of location X is just that number 14. So we create another location, which we'll call P, but actually is location 20. And it contains the number 14. Mm -hmm. And then the next line here, we add one to that. Uh, here there's a tiny bit of annoying technical detail because this number fits in four adjacent locations, not just one. So instead of actually adding one, we actually add four to that 14 and we get 18, which just happens to be the address of that location, just by coincidence. And then the next line tries to read from whatever this address is. So it rather looks like it's going to read the secret key and print it out. And this simple, trivial, little, terrible fact is basically the cause of you know, all the umpty billion pounds and the existential risk of most of the security vulnerabilities out there. I'm very sorry. And so are you. And we have not yet had you know, a major societal collapse because all of the national grid infrastructure is taken down or something, but we will someday soon uh, because of this. It's not as bad as climate change, but potentially worse than COVID. Maybe not worse than COVID, hard to tell. But it's certainly pretty annoying. Okay, so what happens when you actually run this? So you don't run the C code exactly. It gets turned into instructions that the actual hardware is going to execute. And you can look at those list of, lists of instructions. And we've got, not going in now because I will totally run out of time. But what they do is manipulate these numbers. And they are just numbers inside, right? So this P equals P plus 1, it turns into add 4 onto the number there and turn it into the number there. Yeah. Nothing else is happening except those numbers. What happens when you actually compile it and run it with your favorite compiler? Well, it prints out your bin number. Is this what's supposed to happen? No. In this C, technically, it is undefined behavior to do this kind of stuff. And that means the programmer is supposed to not get it wrong. As we know, all of you except the three people that put your hand up at the beginning, programmers are not good at never getting it wrong. And it is pretty clear by now that it is not humanly possible to never get it wrong. Right? We just ask them to do something impossible, and they can't. You know? And this, So this legacy problem we've had basically since the 1950s, or at least the 1960s, uh, because that's when these designs and these languages were invented, and we've never managed to escape. Right? So within a single process, the hardware is just manipulating these numbers with no protection against accident, like in that program, or malice, if someone injects into the source a little bit of something sneaky. Uh, and at a larger scale, between, let's say, between the different processes on your computer, you know, between the web browser and, I don't know, some other thing, um, the hardware does provide some protection, but it, only, it can only work at that pretty coarse granularity of whole processes. It can't work at a fine scale, because everything would run really slowly. It's just not designed for that. Yeah. OK, so what could we possibly do about that? We could just give up and go home and go and do some, I don't know, some painting or some jewelry or something instead, and that would be a fine, fine plan. But we would be full of, full of guilt. Yeah. So. Uh, some colleagues of mine in 2010, uh, Robert Watson and Simon Moore and Peter Neumann, and joined by me a little bit later, and Brooks David, and a large cast of other people, uh, including Ben Laurie, if he's here. Ben, are you here? 
Amy Ben isn't here. Um, a large cast of other people have chipped in. So this is, by academic standards, quite a large project, although by major industry standards, a tiny project. Right? It's been going on for a while, 14 years. So what is the idea? So we're going to change the hardware and the software and do some proofs about it to make sure that some of it is good in order to distinguish between numbers which are addresses and we're going to limit what you can do with those and numbers which are other kinds of data. Right? So we're going to add unforgeable capabilities everywhere. What is an unforgeable capability? So let's go back to that program. So here is what we saw before in which this, this pointer contains the number 18 which is the place where this secret key was stored. Okay, so that's, that's the normal world. And over here is what we would like to have in the world where, oh, this is low enough that I can point and fall off the stage in a scenic way, um, a dramatic way. So here we replace that number by a slightly larger number which has some real meaning in it. So it still has the numeric address but it also contains, coded up in some efficient way, the base and the length of the region of memory that this pointer is allowed to be used to touch. And because that's all there, you can have a very efficient check at runtime whenever you try and use this pointer to access any memory, whether it's allowed or not. And you can fail stop safely if you're trying to do something, if the code is trying to do something that it's not supposed to be allowed to do. Okay, so that sounds good, but... They're just numbers. People could forge them by writing to memory, you say. Ah, uh -huh, no. There is an extra magic bit of data in there that the hardware uses to maintain a record of whether this uh, capability has been legally constructed. And if you try and mess with it in any other way, it will zero that tag, and then that won't be usable for any memory access. So that is a simple idea, the way I describe it here. It is a simple idea, but then what you have to do is try and arrange things so, it is, so that it's plausible that that idea is actually deployable. Plausible that you can port six billion lines eventually, uh, or at least some significant part of that, into this new world. Um, yeah, so if you run that on the original existing infrastructure that will leak the data. If you run that in Cherry, it will fault cleanly. Okay. Um, for those of you that are more technical, so this is protecting not just all the pointers from the C source, but also, or the C++ source, also all the pointers that exist in the implementation thereof, of you know, pointers to stack variables and all kinds of stuff. Um, okay. So far, I talked just about what you might call spatial safety. But there's another aspect to memory safety, which is that if you have some piece of memory, you might have been using it for one thing, and then be done with that, and then try and use it for another thing, you know, temporarily later, and a terrible kind of security vulnerability arises when you get those confused. Right? When the something later can see some stale old data from earlier. Yeah. So what I described so far doesn't help you with that, but the fact that you're distinguishing numbers from pointers and some other hardware tricks mean that you can in fact uh, enforce temporal safety in software without an amazingly large extra cost. Right. There's some caveats about that which I'm not going to go into, but you can also enforce temporal safety. And then this is just doing memory protection at a very fine grain of you know, individual accesses. But if you want to encapsulate whole chunks of software, like the individual tabs in your browser, or the individual MP3 or video player libraries that are running, or the instances of those libraries, then you can use some other machinery, which I'm not really going to explain, but machinery that lets you associate bits of code to bits of data, again in a super efficient way right, for secure encapsulation. So, we are totally going to run out of time. Um, so my colleagues have been building research hardware since 2010. 
And in 2018 or so, we said to ourselves, uh, together with ARM, uh, who design the architecture and the, many of the chips in your mobile phones and things, uh, they were quite interested in this. So we said, together with ARM, to the UK government, dear UK government, here's a cool idea. Surely you would like us to build like an industrial scale demonstrator, which is way beyond what an academic group can do. A real high performance processor and a software stack and everything. So we said that to the UK government, and it's usually quite foreign to me to praise the UK government, especially the ones we've had recently, but uh, lo and behold, they said yes. Um, so they, they chipped in about 70 million a squid, um, and Arm have chipped in, and other companies have chipped in some significant number of squid, um, and have proceeded, so Arm have designed and built a high performance, a high performance silicon processor that has this stuff inside it. And that is what is uh, Morello. And built like something like a thousand of these boards. So this is not a product. This is like a, you know, an industry scale prototype. Um, and it really runs. Right? And there's a whole bunch of research projects and businesses kind of exploring whether you can actually use this for real. Uh, there's a software stack with compilers and you know, PDF renderers and all kinds of things. And porting software to Memory Safe Cherry, it requires very often only tiny changes to the, to the existing code. And sometimes it does need some change, but mostly you just have to recompile the stuff and it works. So uh, my systems e-colleagues have done that. So there's a complete desktop stack. And ideally, I would be running this whole talk from a Cherry box. But uh, I came here by train, and I have to fly to some other country immediately afterwards, and it was just too awkward. So uh, Conrad, who's a researcher in Cambridge, is in a couple of minutes going to show you this live, if everything works. Um, and then I think I should abbreviate the following a bit. Uh, so like a challenge here is to do some really gnarly but totally important kind of software. So uh, Chromium is like 50 million lines of code with 190 libraries and a really fancy language runtime that uses pointers in really complicated ways. Can you port that to Cherry? Uh, well, quite a lot of it so far, and only with nine staff months, which is kind of trivial. Um, it's a security feature. You would like to know that it is not wrong. So we have proved with machine-checked mathematical proof that that Morello architecture design enforces the property that arbitrary code, how it, whatever it does, cannot forge capabilities. So that's quite nice. Um, OK, then for chopping things up into compartments, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can do it along existing library boundaries or with code processes and both of these are being explored. A really cool thing about this is that the cost of calling one process from another turns into almost nothing, which is you know, massively faster than existing code. So uh, is this something that's feasibly adoptable? On a small scale, like in microcontrollers and, well, larger than microcontrollers, but security critical small processors with a small software stack. It's totally adoptable. People are doing that right now. Uh, is it adoptable in every phone and, uh, and data center processor everywhere? There is good evidence, but um, making that you know, industrial case is a tricky thing. Uh, so, um, but on a microcontroller scale, Microsoft and Google and Low Risk and SCI and Codasip and the Risk Five International are all building uh, or um, specifying variously uh, Cherry processors right now, and some of these are, are sort of to live in the roots of trust of larger SOCs. Thank you. Um, other people seem to think it's a good idea. So recently. Uh, various organizations, including like the defensive bits of security agencies. So these are on the whole the good guys, the NCSC and uh, FBI and other people. They are quite keen on Cherry and other approaches to memory safety. Uh, the Office of the White House 
He's very keen on memory safety at the moment and has put out a very good report, well, we love it, uh, which talks about different ways that you can conceivably achieve memory safety um, with Cherry as one of them. So, six billion lines of code plus two, it's certainly not good now, but you could conceivably make it be good. Cherry is not in, so another obvious option is to recode things in Rust. And Rust is very lovely. And one, there are lots of opportunities for Cherry plus Rust. So these are not in opposition to each other, but it is worth thinking about the amount of Rust code in the world written by anybody, as far as we know, at least the open source Rust. And uh, that number is about 50 million or something. That is less than the amount of C and C++ code that this quite tiny academic team has ported to Cherry C++ in the last 12 months. It's just a lot easier to port the things than to rewrite from scratch. Um, okay, so I think now we should try and switch to Conrad, who's a researcher at Cambridge, who has very kindly uh, agreed to do this uh, demo by remote control if it works. So let's see. Always good to have a little tension and drama um, in these cases. So that looks like we've got Conrad. And maybe we'll see if we can hear Conrad. Hey, Peter, can you hear me? Yes! Okay, great. I cannot hear you, but I'm assuming that you can hear it. Hi, everyone. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, we'd like to show a couple of examples um, how Cherry works uh, based on the R Morello platform example, and more specifically with Cherry BSD. Um, I'm sitting in a computer lab. Uh, I have a Morello desktop next to me here. But in the screen, you can see a picture that I took two years ago uh, when I got my first Morello desktop delivered to the lab. Uh, it runs Cherry BSD, and I'm actually demonstrating this uh, presentation from the box itself. Um, it runs Cherry BSD, uh, um, running the latest development branch that I compiled yesterday, I think. And, uh, it's compiled for the pure capability API, both in the kernel and in the user space case. It means that all memory accesses from the kernel and user applications by default uh, use Cherry capabilities. Uh, there are a couple of uh, programs that don't use uh, Cherry capabilities because those programs aren't adapted to Cherry, like the Chrome browser, but everything else does uh, make use of Cherry capabilities. Additionally, in my setup, uh, I have two features enabled by default, uh, the revocations and library-based compromisation model features that Peter mentioned. It means that all these programs that uh, use Cherry also benefit from temporal safety features and uh, compromisation. Uh, first, uh, I would like to get back to the example that Peter mentioned, which uh, leaked uh, a secret key. Um, I have all examples pre-compiled so that we don't waste time on running compiler commands here. If you run this program compiled for the hybrid API, which doesn't use Cherry capabilities uh, at all, then uh, it will successfully leak the key as Peter demonstrated. However, if you run it uh, compiled for Cherry ABI, it successfully terminated uh, uh, with a security exception that the architecture throws. We have the GDP debugger and a lot of two chain uh, adapted to Cherry, so we can attach uh, GDP to this program and see what exact instruction caused the crash. And here we can see that the Cherry uh, capability violation was triggered by a load instruction that tried to load one word from uh, a memory location referenced by C0 register uh, that has the address uh, equal to the upper bound of the uh, region that the capability references. When GDB prints uh, the bounds, uh, the second uh, address is the upper bound plus one. Um, uh, which is one by the address one past the uh, maximum address that can be referenced by this capability. Um, the second example I would like to refer to is uh, relates to temporal safety. Um, as Peter mentioned, uh, 
Cherry allows to build temporal safety mechanisms in software. And on Cherry BSD, we have a re revocation mechanism that uh, puts all objects allocated by the standard allocator, which is malloc, into quarantine after these objects are freed. It means that uh, the memory underlying uh, this object cannot be reused for further uh, allocations until all references to those objects are revoked. That revocation can happen asynchronously or synchronously by a special call to the malloc revoke function. So let's see how this program uh, behaves under GDB. At the stage, uh, we free the object, which is here. The CP variable, uh, which is a capability, is valid. But just after we call malloc revoke, the same um, a capability or a variable is invalid, which is indicated in GDB with the invalid keyword. It means that the malloc revoke function call sweep the, me the memory and invalidated or cleared all types of capabilities that um, were re referencing objects that were passed to the free function call. Oh, actually, if we fully run this program, uh, it, it crashes at the load instruction when uh, it tries to load a word from, again, a capability uh, from memory referenced by the C0 uh, capability register, which is um, the CP variable. And the last example I would like to refer to uh, is uh, the comparison uh, mechanism uh, that focuses on libraries, uh, which places, uh, as Peter mentioned, all libraries into separate compartments that don't share their internal state, state with other libraries. All function calls between the program and libraries and uh, between libraries themselves are wrapped with uh, special trampolines that make sure that capabilities don't leak between those compartments and uh, all uh, relevant state, uh, runtime state, is updated appropriately from for the uh, colli of a function call, which is some destination compartment, and on the way back, that state is restored to the caller state. Um, in order to demonstrate at what scale we can uh, apply this compensation model, uh, I'll, uh, I, I would like to refer to the ocular uh, document viewer that I used to display the picture at the beginning of this demonstration. Uh, if we have a look at the list of libraries uh, that this program ocular is linked with, we'll discover that there's a lot of them. And I'm pretty sure that the developers of the ocular program didn't audit any of these libraries uh, to make sure that they don't contain any malicious code. Uh, in fact, we have uh, uh, the GDB uh, debugger extended to uh, be aware of this compromisation model, and we can attach to this ocular program that I have running. In this specialized debugger, we can see that uh, it can print what domain transitions were executed uh, as part of the backtrace here. Uh, for example, we have uh, this uh, function call, which uh, uh, was a function call from the Ocular program into the libqt5 widgets uh, shared library. It means that uh, whatever Ocular uh, start on its stack, for example, isn't accessible to the libqt5 widgets uh, library, because when a thread enters this library, uh, the trampoline that wraps this call uh, updates the stack pointer to a stack that is specific to this library, meaning that the lib widgets, uh, the libqt5 widgets library doesn't have access to the stack of the color of the function from it at the architectural level. Uh, that's all features I wanted to present. Uh, if you would like to read more uh, about them, I highly uh, advise to go to cherrybsd.org. There is a link to the Getting Started Guide uh, that uh, explains more in detail uh, how these features work and how they're implemented. Thanks. Okay. So, it's all terrible, 
but a tiny glimmer of hope. And, you know, next time you're a major industry or government person making a major purchasing decision, you might think, how can I specify that my software that I'm just committing to is not totally terrible? Thank you.